Amen. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen again. God is good how often and all the time. Look at somebody this evening says, good to see you. Amen. Amen. Y'all was talking about the rain that came through. I was asleep. I don't know. I ain't hear nothing. I don't know what happened. I don't know when it came and I don't know when it left. I just, <laughs> I see the remnants of it. <laughs> but but you, you, made a, you made a perfect point in your prayer um, that the rain is necessary in life. And although we don't always like the rain, rain is necessary for growth and other things to happen. So, so, so we can't always expect it to be sunshine and a cool breeze every day. Every now and then we can expect some rainfall. We can expect some thunder. We can expect some high tides. But it's all working together ultimately for the good of them that love God. Amen. We had a wonderful um, time in the Lord on this morning. Again, um, just so good to see all those that are visiting with us. God is sending those our way. We're going to remain prayerful um, that they won't just be visitors, but they'll become members one of these days. Amen. Amen. We're going to be praying for that and let us be um, doing all we can to make sure that we're inviting those to come and hear about Jesus Christ. There were several that brought it to my attention this morning. They said, preach, you weren't up there long. Don't get used to it. I'm glad you brought it. I'm glad you, I'm glad you brought it to my attention. I'm glad somebody was paying attention amen so so i gotta get my my two hours in next week remind me remind me i gotta get it in next week <laughs> amen amen i did like i used to do man let me tell you when i first started out preaching um when i was like eight nine years old i would literally get up in the pulpit about 10 o'clock and 10 09 i was giving the invitation <laughs> so look i would get up speak up shut up and sit down is what i would do amen those days are long ago praise god praise god <laughs> No more serving this. We can look. No more milk. We eat steak right here. Ain't <laughs> amen. Amen. Let us be going to Exodus chapter 7. Exodus chapter 7. And um, we're going to read verses 8 to 12 for our consideration on this evening. We'll continue in um, our study um, in the Old Testament. Um, we started out with Genesis and we did a little bit in Exodus on last week. So we're going to go back. Um, to Exodus chapter 7 today. And what I love uh, mainly about this is everything that we're going through is referenced somewhere in the New Testament scripture. So what we have here is a correlation that's going on that even though we're in Old Testament scripture, we can connect dots all the way over into the New Testament to let us know that in fact God's word is true, God's word is right, and is exactly what it said that it is. So Exodus chapter 7 verses 8 to 12 and it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh shall speak to you, saying, Show a miracle for you. Then thou shalt say unto Aaron, Take thy rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. I would have took off. I don't know about y'all. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in the manner with their enchantments, for they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents, but Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. Amen. Amen. Our, 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 our discussion, if I was to give uh, it a topic for this afternoon, we're going to be talking about shadows and foreshadows. Shadows and foreshadows. Now, um, when we talk about a type, when you hear about a type in the Bible, a type is a, a figure or a representative of something that is to come. Something that has not happened yet, but sooner or later it's about to come in the past. And an anti-type is the reality of that type that you're talking about. So let, let, me, let me break it, make it simple for you. Let's say you are walking outside and you step in some mud. The impression that you leave is the type of your foot. And the anti-type is your actual foot. So the Old Testament is full of types that lead us into anti-types in the New Testament. You read in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 1, it says, it teaches us that the law of Moses was a shadow or a representation of what was going to come under the new covenant. So let's look at an example we have in Romans chapter 5. 
5 and verse number 14, it says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. So Paul is telling us that Adam, in and of himself, was a type or a shadow of Jesus, which makes him the antitype. So look at, uh, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, um, beginning at verse number 45 and concluding at verse number 49. It says, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. See, he said the first Adam became a living being, but the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth made of dust, and the second man is the Lord from heaven. And was the man from dust, so also are those who are made of dust. As is with the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. So, so the reason I have explained this to us is because as we grow through our study of the Old Testament, there are going to be many times that they show these types and these anti-types. And in our lesson tonight, we're going to be examining the ten plagues that we read about that happened in the exchange between Moses and Pharaoh. And, and, and how the Pharaoh is a type of Satan. So let's begin in Exodus chapter 7, beginning at verse number 8. And the Bible says, Then the Lord spake to Moses and Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh speaks to you, saying, Show a miracle for yourselves. Then you shall say to Aaron, Take your rod and cast it before Pharaoh and let it become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh and did so just as the Lord commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. But Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, so the magicians of Egypt. They also did in like manner with their enchantments. For every man threw down his rod, and they became serpent. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rod. And Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not heed them as the Lord had said. So God knew that Pharaoh was going to ask for a sign. He already knew how Pharaoh was. He knew his heart. He knew his intention. He already knew that he was going to ask for a sign. And so Aaron was to throw, throw his staff down on the ground, and it was going to become a serpent. Now, when I put myself in the shoes of this Pharaoh, I can understand why he would want proof that Moses and Aaron's God really existed. Now, y'all just telling me something just to get what y'all want, or is this God that y'all talking about really the God that y'all say that he is? So you might, you might, as we talked about a little bit on last week in our study, down there in Egypt, they had all kinds of various gods. I mean, folk was worshiping this, they was worshiping that, anything that roofed, anything that meowed, people were making a God out of it, and they were worshiping it. And Pharaoh, he called in his magicians, and they were were able to reproduce the magic with their staffs that they had did. But it always shows you no matter when the devil puts out a counterfeit, you can always tell what is real. Whenever the devil puts out something fake, something that is pseudo, something that is false, God will always show up and let you know, hey, this right here is the real thing. So one may ask, how were they able to do this? There were several possibilities. First, you will notice that the magicians were called after Aaron's staff was turned into a serpent. It was possible that they were told what he did and had time to portray their trick to do the same thing. There were there are magicians who can do the same trick today. Um, it was funny um, when me and um, Marissa got to go to a, a, a magic show. And um, this man, he uh, just out of all the people that were in the place, he called Marissa out. He used her as a prop. And um, he asked her, he was like, uh, he said, I want you to think of a box of cereal. And so she thought of the box of cereal. And then he asked another gentleman to ask, you know, how, what is the price, you know, of it or whatever like that. And so he gave the price. And the whole time throughout the show, he had this box that was up at the top. And so when it was finally over, after he had asked them all the questions, they lowered down the box and he opened it up. And it was the cereal she had said with the price that the young man had suggested. <laughs> the serpent that was provided by God ate up those other serpents that was threw out on the ground 
showing them that God's power was greater than those magicians. And however, Pharaoh did not want to believe, and the Bible says that his heart grew hard just as it said that it would. So, so this reminds us of the Pharisees and the Sadducees that we've come to know about in the New Testament scripture. Jesus, if you remember, had shown many miracles. He did many miraculous signs and wonders to prove that he was, in fact, God's son in the flesh. And these men could not deny these miracles, but just like Pharaoh, they hardened their hearts. And many today, even today, the world that we live in, they hardened their hearts as well because they don't want want to accept the truth as it is found in the Bible, the word of God. And we must be careful that we don't allow ourselves, if we don't know it or not, to harden our hearts against God and against the word of God. So this brings us to the 10 plagues. It's interesting that most of these plagues that God brings on Egypt shows that God has power over their supposed gods. It shows that, that, that the big God got power over the little gods that they had down there that they were serving. So we read about the first plague. What was the first plague? God turned the water into blood. In Exodus chapter 7, verses 14 through 25, we read about that. And once again, we see here that Moses tells Pharaoh to go down there. He said, let my people go. And if he does not do it, I'll turn all the waters in Egypt. They're going to be turned to blood. And of course, we know that Pharaoh would not listen. And Moses goes and he tells Aaron to hold out his rod, stretching out his hand over the waters. And just as Moses, all the water turned to blood and even the fish died and began to stink. God ain't playing. When God tells you to do something, let me tell you, God means exactly what he says. And we know that once again, Pharaoh's magicians were able, were about, they were trying to turn waters to blood themselves. And this caused Pharaoh to harden his heart again. You might be thinking, if all the water was turned to blood, then where did the magicians get the clean water to turn into blood? I believe the answer is found in verse number 24. And the Bible says, so all the Egyptians dug all around the river for water to drink because they could not drink the water of the river. So the water that was underground was okay. And so this is most likely where they got their clean water from. And the second plague that we read about is in Exodus chapter 8, verses 1 through 15. And that's where we read about the frogs. Now, I don't know about y'all, but... After I seen the water turn, I know this would have got somebody, but to, you know, just to, to see the water turn into blood, that would have been enough for me, you know? You know, you know, I, you, you got me sold. Yet you are who you say you are. Get your people, go and do what it is that you need to do. I would have believed that at that moment, but Pharaoh needed a little more, a little more convincing. So we got the frogs coming now. And once again, Moses tell Pharaoh, let my people go or you're going to be plagued with frogs. And Pharaoh didn't listen. And sure enough, here came the frogs. I mean, they was everywhere, just rivet, rivet, just jumping everywhere. And verse 7 tells us that the magicians were able to bring about frogs as well. However, apparently they were not able to make the frogs go away because Pharaoh asked Moses to get rid of the frogs. Exodus chapter 8, verses 8 through 10 reads like this. Then Moses called for, then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and my people, and I will let the people go that they may sacrifice to the Lord. And Moses said to Pharaoh, Accept the honor of saying, Will I shall intercede for you, for your servants and for your people, to destroy the frogs from you and your house, that they may remain in the river only. So he said, tomorrow. Now, Pharaoh makes the promise that he's going to let the children of Israel go if Moses got rid of the frogs. And one thing I cannot understand about the text we just read is why, why when Pharaoh had the chance to name when the frogs would go away, why did he not say right now? If you really, I mean, if you really want God to take the frogs away, well, why can't you say, Lord, come get these things today. You can come right now. You ain't got to wait till the night. Lord, come and get them right now. But Pharaoh, Pharaoh wanted one more night with the frogs. <laughs> and Moses kept his word. And as the frogs died, but when Pharaoh saw them, they were gone, once again, what happened? He hardened his heart. 
and he would not let the children of Israel go. And then Pharaoh is like Satan here because he didn't mind telling a lie to get what he wanted. He didn't mind lying to get his way. Third plague that we read about is what? Lice. Now, we already got frogs. We already got water turning into blood. <laughs> Look, now we got lice. In his third plague, Aaron touches dust on the earth. And it becomes lice, or some people say fleas. And they get on every person and every animal. And the magician tried to reproduce this miracle, but they could not. And they made a great confession. Exodus chapter 8, verse 19. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. Yeah. Yeah. But Pharaoh's heart grew hard. And he did not heed them just as the Lord has said. I mean, now, even the magicians, they got some sense. Now, y'all, they are saying, hey, man, we ain't never seen nothing like this happen. We ain't, never seen, we ain't never produced no miracles, no magic like this. This got to have the hand of God up in it. So the magicians understood that this was a powerful God. But Pharaoh hardened his heart. Then we got the flies. In Exodus chapter 8, verses 20 through 32. This plague is interesting because this time God was to show Pharaoh that he was God by causing swarms of flies to fill the land of Egypt, but not the land of Goshen where the children of Israel were. Now, just as Moses stated the flies only plagued the Pharaoh's people, could you imagine, church, how weird that would be and how hard it would be to deny that God was controlling all of this? Now, now these folk would have had to have been some Trump supporters. It was a rigged election. It was rigged. There was massive amounts of voter fraud. I mean, massive amounts. I mean, people were dumping in votes at 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning. I mean, I mean, just massive fraud. It's, it's out there. They're just not talking about it. About it. I mean, just plenty of fraud, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, could you imagine how crazy these people had to be to deny that God was actually in this thing? And we learned two more ways that Pharaoh was really like Satan. Exodus chapter 8, verse 25 says, Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Go, sacrifice to your God in the land. <laughs> Pharaoh here is trying to get Moses to compromise with him. What's he trying to do? He's trying to get Moses to compromise with him and go against what God has said. He is willing to let them sacrifice only if they do it there instead of in the wilderness. Satan is the same way today. He wants us to compromise with him and go against the word of God so that he can still have us under his control. Moses basically says, no way we got to go into the wilderness. I know you're trying to give us a way out, but God has already given us a way out. And the way that God has prepared is surely greater than the way that you have prepared. Exodus chapter 8, verse 28, the Bible says, and, Mo and Pharaoh said, I'll let you go, that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only you shall not go very far away and intercede for me. Again, he tries to make it sound good. I'll let you go, just don't go too far. This is similar to what the devil does to us on a daily basis as well. He might say, oh, you can go to worship God, but, but don't get too far away from these worldly things. Yeah. Keep one foot over there and leave one foot over here. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17. Therefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. Moses, Moses doesn't accept this either. And he tells Pharaoh to stop being deceitful. And when Moses removes the flies, once again, Pharaoh would not let the people go. Here, yeah, what we got next? We got diseased animals. In Exodus chapter 9, verses 1 through 7, we got diseased animals. It is the plague of the animals of Egypt. They would get a disease and die, but none of the livestock of the children of Israel would get the disease. Just as Moses said all the things came to pass, but still... Pharaoh was continuously hardening his heart. Then we got the boils. Now, man, if this wasn't enough. Now, y'all, we already got water. Just imagine you out there taking you a swim, and all of a sudden it just turned into blood. 
We got the lights that came. We got the flies have come. We got frogs that we've had to deal with. But now we got to deal with boils. This was the plague. Of, Moses and Aaron took hands full of ashes, the Bible says, from the furnace. And they scattered them in the air. And boils just start to come up over all men and beasts. One, a boil is painful enough. I couldn't even imagine being covered in boils. Verse 11 tells us that the magicians couldn't even stand before Moses because of the boils. But not even this made Pharaoh let the people go. What we got coming up next, we got hell. H-A-I-L, hell. In, in, in Exodus chapter 9, verses 13 through 35, and in this plague, Pharaoh is warned that if he doesn't let the children of Israel go, that God will unleash a heavy hail and rain that Egypt had never seen before. And he tells them that if they are, they are out in the field, man or beast, that they will be killed by the hail that's going to be falling. And God gives Pharaoh and his people fair warning so that they could protect their lives and what was left of the animals' lives. And the Bible says in Exodus chapter 9, verses 20 and 21, He that feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his cattle flee into the houses. And he that regarded not the word of the Lord left his servants and his cattle in the field. Now, some of these people were starting to get a clue that when Moses said his God was going to do something, this stuff started happening. He wasn't just saying stuff to say, but it seemed like everything that he said, his God said was going to happen, it happened. But there were still people just like today, everywhere you got men of God standing, telling people what thus said the Lord, telling people what thus said the Lord. And people don't want to listen, people don't want to hear, people don't want to pay it any attention. But if God said it, you can just about bet it's going to happen. You can stand on it because God is too good to tell us anything but the truth. And there are a lot of people in this world today that are just as stubborn as these Egyptians. Even when they are presented with the truth of the word and they can clearly see what they have been presented and they can clearly see what they need to do to be saved, they simply resist the truth and they end up suffering the consequences, which is far more than just losing your life. Once again, we see in verse number 26 that the children of Israel did not receive any rain, and they did not get any hail. And in verse number 28, the Bible says, Pharaoh pleased with Moses and falsely claims again, hey, you know what? I'll let the people go if you make the hail and the rail stop. Moses stops the hail, and once again, what happened? Pharaoh changed his mind and would not let the people go. And also in this plague, the Bible says that all of their crops were destroyed and even the trees suffered great damage. But you will notice in verse number 32 that the wheat and the spelt were not touched because they had not grown out yet. That information becomes important for our next plague, the plague of the locusts in, in Exodus chapter 10. Verses 20, verses 1 through 20. All this stuff just connects if we pay attention. Verses 1 through 20. Moses warns Pharaoh that if you do not let my people go, you are going to be plagued with locusts. They will be so many that you won't be able to see the earth and they're going to fill up your houses. I can see y'all, some of y'all sisters running now again, just trying to get out the way, all falling down, trying to get out the way from these. <laughs> uh, somebody said, not just a sister. <laughs> So if everything ain't yet destroyed, when the locusts come, they're going to eat up everything else that ain't yet been destroyed. So even though everything that had not yet destroyed, that had not yet outgrown, God said when the locusts come, they'll finish off all that stuff. So we know that there was going to be no wheat, the spelt, the, all the leaves, all of that was going to be gone. Exodus chapter 10, verse number 7. And Pharaoh's servant said unto them, How long shall this man be a snare unto us? Let the men go, that they may serve the Lord their God. Knowest thou not yet that Egypt is destroyed? Oh, so these people say, Hey, Pharaoh, we can see the writing on the wall. Open up your eyes. Pay attention. Can't you see what's going on? They were basically saying, Wake up. 
smell the coffee. Let these people go serve their God so we can stop suffering. And this must have got the attention of Pharaoh because he calls Moses and Aaron and he tells them, you can go worship your God. But we learn from this chapter 11, he only wants the men to go so the children and women would be left behind. You can take the men, but leave the women and children behind. Once again, Pharaoh is being like Satan, wanting Moses to compromise with the request that God had given him. And any of y'all know that when it comes to God and his word, you can't compromise with the devil. You can't compromise with him none of the way. What the old song says, don't let the devil drive, ride, because if you let him ride, then after a while, what's going to happen? He going to want to drive? You can't give him any room because if you give him an inch, he's surely going to take you a couple miles. So after Moses and Aaron were booted out of Pharaoh's sight, Moses stretches out his rod and an east wind blows in a huge swarm of locusts. Verse number 16 of Exodus chapter 10 says that Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in haste. And he said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now therefore forgive, I pray thee. How many times has he said the same old thing? I pray thee, my sin only this once and entreat the Lord your God that he may take away from me this death only. Now, once again, Moses complies. He goes with him and a west wind comes up and it takes all the locusts into the Red Sea. We're going to get to the Red You know, so the Red Sea is going to come up later up. So, so all the locusts go to the Red Sea. And once again, Pharaoh changes his mind and sins against God again. While Pharaoh is a type of Satan, there are definitely people living today that act the same way that he did. I'm reminded of those people even today that have strongholds and, and things that they are dealing with. And they tell you over and over again, I'm going to let this thing go. I'm going to get rid of it. I'm going to get out of this. But what they do a lot of times is they turn right back around and they get themselves right back into the same snap. But the proverbial writer lets us know in Proverbs chapter 20 and verse number 11, as a dog returns to his vomit, so a fool repeats folly. Then we got darkness. In this plague, all Egypt was pitch black for three days. And, and y'all, they ain't had no flashlights. They ain't had no generator that in the, out there in the shed that they could hook up or none of that. You know, I'm sure they had some candles or something like that. But it was dark for three days. It is the kind of darkness that you can't even see your hand in front of your face. That kind of darkness. God makes a difference between the Egyptians and his people because the Egyptians get that. Because his people, guess what they had? They had light in their dwellings. So even though it was dark for everybody else, the people of God had dwelling. Can you see how even though God is punishing one group of people, that even though his people are among them, that God can still decide to bless them? And that lets us know that even though we live in a society where it seems like so many people are leaving God, so many people are down in God, they are down in the faith, that even in the midst of that, that God can still bless his people, that God can still look out for his people, and God can still take care of his people. So the Bible says in Exodus chapter 10 verse 24, then Pharaoh called to Moses saying, go serve the Lord. Only let your flocks and your herds be kept. There. It's always something with him. He always got some hidden agenda to go along with it. Let your little ones also go away. And just like the devil again, Pharaoh was being persistent. But Moses tells him, hey, no way. I got to do what the Lord say do. We got to have our animals so that we can have sacrifices while we're out there in the land. But Pharaoh didn't want this. And it did happen so he wouldn't let them go again. He even said to Moses that if he sees him again, he said, I'm going to kill you the next time I see you. Yeah, God, that's it. He said, next time you come around here, man, I'm going to kill you the next time I see you. And Moses tell him, don't worry. I won't see your face again. Now we got the tent plague. Exodus chapter 11, verses 1 through 10, also in chapter 12, verses 29 through 30, was the death of the firstborn child. God tells Moses after this plague that Pharaoh would not let my people go. Because in this plague, God said he would go out at midnight 
and all the firstborn of Egypt and even the animals would die. And the text says that there would be a crying in Egypt. There would be a wailing going on in Egypt. And again, God made a distinction between the Egyptians and the children of Israel because he was not going to kill their firstborn man, neither their animal. Now, between the time of this statement and the time God comes to kill the firstborn, the Passover is instituted. And we're going to be examining that more closely next week. But the children of Israel were to put the blood on the inside of the doorposts and the second doorpost, so that when the death angel came by and saw the blood, what was going to happen? He was going to pass on over their house. And they did this, and just like everything else God had said, church, sure enough, at midnight, the death angel came, and all the firstborn in Egypt died, and finally, Pharaoh let the children of Israel go. Can you, what, man, why did it take so much? Why did God have to do all of this? And this can even be for some of us today. Why is it taking God having to do so much in our life to try to get our attention? Why is it God having to send so many things our way? Because sometimes you got to think, don't nothing just happen in your life. Sometimes God is trying to get your attention. Like the old song said, maybe God is trying to tell you something. Maybe God wants you to get somewhere and be still and sit down so he can tell you what it is that he wants you to know. And they did this. And at midnight, the destroyer came. And their children were saved. Their family was saved because they had the blood on the doorpost. And it's sad that it had to go that far, all that way, just for Pharaoh to accept the truth. But many like Pharaoh today because sometimes it takes a major event to happen in our lives before we finally come to Jesus. It takes somebody to pass away. In order for us to get shook up or scared and say, oh, I need to get right. I need to start going to the church. I need to remain faithful. Why does it take serious stuff like that to happen in order for us to remain faithful? I don't know about y'all, but just every day of our lives, us waking up, God blessing us with that. It's enough for us to want to serve him. It's enough for us to want to remain faithful. It's enough for us to want to do his will. God has given us borrowed time. How much time you got, you don't know. So with the time that you have, we need to be trying to serve God not just with part of ourselves, not just with part of our being but we need to be all the way in with God and serve him with all of our might with all of our heart and with all of our soul and we need to be careful that we don't be like Pharaoh and try to compromise the truth of the word of God we need to be careful that we don't become stubborn to the word of God like Pharaoh was. Because if we be honest and say, sometimes, if not all the time, the word of God can get us just like you get anybody else. And just because it corrects us in a certain way, we shouldn't become stubborn or bashful against the word of God, but recognize that it is exactly what it says, that it is the word of God, and we got to govern ourselves according to what the word of God has said. So Adam was a, a, a type of Christ. He was, he was a type of Christ. He was a foreshadowing of that one that was to come. And this is good for us. This is good for us to let us know that can, nobody can honestly walk around here and tell us that the word of God was just compiled by some people in the 1800s. And then it was given to us. It was thrown to us. Because you have these scriptures tying in with one another. And there is no way that an individual 7,000 years before something happened would know anything about it. Unless God has something to do with it. So we can rest assured that the word of God, it is profitable. The word of God is true. It is without error. It is without controversy. And we can stand on the word of God because the Bible is right. And if the Bible is right, everybody else is just wrong. I mean, I mean, ain't no other choice. If the Bible is right and if God's word is true, everybody else just flat out wrong. Let God be true. And every man be found a liar. Let God be true. Let's stand on God's word. 
Let's believe what he said. And it's good for us to have these things because even in our, our studying with other people and our endeavors to share the gospel with those that don't know Jesus, oftentimes they're going to ask you questions. Like, how you know this? How you know that? And it's good to be able to go right back. So let, let, let me take you all, all the way back here to the beginning and show you how it happened, what was going to happen, and how it was going to happen. And it's good to have all of that so that we can make our calling. And our election sure in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So um, I want to take this time to thank you for being such an attentive listeners and prayerfully. Um, you were blessed um, by the message that was given on this evening. And we thank all of those that tuned in um, with us on this afternoon. And prayerfully you were encouraged um, by the word on, on this afternoon. And nothing else, I want you to know God's word is true. And even though we live in a world, we live in a time where somebody saying this, somebody saying that, everybody saying this, everybody saying that. I ain't worried about what everybody else is saying, I'm worried about what thus said the Lord. If it ain't in the book, you ain't nothing but a crook. If it ain't in the book, you ain't nothing but a crook. I want to know what thus said the Lord, because it is what thus said the Lord that's going to judge us in the last day. So my brother, my sister, maybe you're here, maybe you're watching with us today. You're not a Christian. You're not a member of the body of Christ. We're just a church of Christ. We invite you to Jesus. Come by hearing his word. Believe in the same. Repent of your sins. Confess Christ as your Savior. Be buried with him in baptism. Allow Christ himself to add you to his body and when God puts you in, no man can take you away. And if you are already a member of the body of Christ, but you stand in the need of prayer, let us know how we can pray for you today. You can do that at this time as together we stand and sing the song of invitation. Holy Spirit, dwell in me touch my eyes that I might see all your 